thank the Chester Green Academy for the invitation to speak to you this evening and to all who have taken time from their busy schedules to be here. I am somewhat hesitant, however. The last time I related the liberal arts to something theological was Pentecost Sunday a few years ago. I was at a conference at Hillsdale College run by the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. And I had been meditating a bit upon the hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus, and the phrase, Septi Formis Munere, sevenfold in gift, struck me since we had been discussing the seven liberal arts. I wrote a poem about it, and to further symbolize the number seven, I used for the meter, somewhat playfully, T.S. Eliot's poetry, after all, is superior amusement. I am a heptameter, what the old English poets called a fourteener, for the fourteen-syllable line. Da -da 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 the poem starts, Now seven are the liberal arts, as sages taught of old. On Pentecost the Spirit came, his gifts too, sevenfold. Upon sharing the poem and explaining it to some colleagues there, I explained that the only 14er modern audience had likely heard was the theme song for Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Fast forward a year or so, and I get a video call from Andrew Seeley, who runs the Institute. He just says, you aren't going to believe this. He's at some event, and a group of middle school children are about to sing, and all of a sudden I hear, now seven are the liberal arts, as you just are old. We met 
mentioned T.S. Eliot earlier. So his favorite line from his, his uh, famous line from Four Quartets is helpful here. In my beginning is my end. If we understand correctly the nature of the human person, we will know not only where to begin, but where we are headed. One does not get very far into the Baltimore Catechism before these questions are answered. Who made you? God. This could be a little bit of a question to answer. Who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? To know, love, and serve him in this life and be happy with him forever and next. All Catholic education must stem from this amazing truth that we are created in God's image and created to live in communion with Him. If we get either of those things wrong, it's game over. As Anthony Eslin points out in his Forward to Strats book, how decisive for the Christian educator or for any educator of goodwill is the revelation that man is made in the image and likeness of the three-person God? <laughs> that is like asking, what difference will it make to us if we keep in mind that a human being is made not for the processing of data, but for wisdom? Not for the utilitarian satisfaction of appetite, but for love. Not for the domination of nature, but for participation in it. Not for the autonomy of an isolated self, but for communion. It's no accident that Caldecott has structured his plan for education upon the three ways of attributing, which themselves reflect the three primary axes of being revealed by God. Of knowing, that is to say giving, of being known, that is to say receiving, and of the loving gift. As Dante puts it, O light that dwell within thyself alone, who alone know thyself are known, and smile with love upon the knowing. Last canto of the Paradise, vision of the Trinity. So tonight I am speaking of the liberal arts in general, of course, but we'll be focusing on the three arts of the trivium, the arts that have to do with language, and in a way, the arts which have, which have to do with meaning and spirit, while the arts of the quadrivium have to do with quantity, and therefore, more properly, with matter. I shall attempt to unpack a bit what Caldecott is saying as so beautifully summarized by Tony Eslin, how are grammar, dialect, and rhetoric, the three arts of the trivium, related to giving, receiving, and sharing? Mythos, logos, and ethos. Father, Son, and Spirit. I will let Caldecott himself explain his central idea. I have already written in Beauty for Truth's sake about the disenchantment of the world that took place in modern times. Very Chestertonian statement, by the way. We have educated ourselves to believe that meaning and purpose, if they exist at all, are not given by a creator or a divine source, but are invented and imposed upon the world by man. If, as a society, we agree on certain values, it must be because we have negotiated such agreement through the procedures of the market or state not because we have submitted ourselves to an objective truth. I wrote that book of the need, I wrote in that book of the need to recover a poetic way of knowing the meaning of things by reforging the connection between self and the world. The self is not a separate substance, condemned only to observe the world from a distance, but can understand it from the inside by a kind of imaginative sympathy learning to read, no doubt at first naively, the language of nature. The central idea of the present book is very simple. It is that education is not primarily about the acquisition of information. It is not even about the acquisition of skills in the conventional sense to equip us for particular roles in society. It is about how we become more human and therefore more free in the truest sense of that word. This is a broader and deeper question, but no less practical. Too often, we have not been educating our humanity. We have been educating ourselves for doing rather than for being. So the liberal arts have their roots in Greek education and are central to the educational thought of the church. 
Hugh of St. Victor, who died in 1141, that's how old school we're going here, in his work, The Didiscalicon, defines the trivial arts this way. Grammar is the knowledge of how to speak without error. Dialectic is clear-sighted argument which separates the true from the false. Rhetoric is the discipline of persuading to every suitable thing. But the subtitle of Hugh St. Victor's work is a studio legendi on the study of reading. This shows that he is not only thinking of the trivia as three separate subjects that have to do with words, but three ways of reading, three approaches to the truth, three stages of learning that mirror actually Dorothy Day's uh, stages in her famous essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, the parrot stage, the pert stage, and the poet stage, that she pretty much parallels to um, elementary, middle, and high school. But they're more than stages, since they're not so much successive as cyclical and mutually enriching. In any act of knowledge, as in any act of love, the being of both knower and known, lover and beloved, is simultaneously given, received, and shared. Grammar, mythos, and the Father. When we think of grammar, Think of rules. But these rules are not arbitrary. They are the rules imposed upon us by the reality we are dealing with. Aristotle's logic begins with the categories, the predicates, the different ways we can say something about something. But as I emphasize in my language classes, language has to come up with ways of expressing what reality gives us. We live in time, so verbs need to have tenses. We experience persons, places, things, substantives, substances that have qualities that we can express with adjectives. In no language are the adjectives modified by nouns, just as no supermarket is organized by color or in ascending order of price. Pope Benedict says in Caritas in Veritatum, nature expresses a design of love and truth. It is prior to us, and it has been given to us by God as the setting for our life. Nature is more, more than raw material to be manipulated at our pleasure. It is a wondrous work of the Creator containing a grammar, which sets forth ends and criteria for its wise use, not its reckless exploitation. So in any discipline, we must begin with the basics, the basic truths which we are given. To ponder these is to grow slowly, gradually in knowledge and appreciation for the nature and properties of what we are studying. We begin with memory, with memorizing certain facts in the understanding of which we shall grow, gradually and at a later date. It is very important not to get the basics wrong. There has been a huge push against memorization in English, which strangely has not been as virulent in men where the times tables still need to be mastered, or even in music, where scales still need to be learned. And if that's not done, if you don't have your math facts, if you, don't, if you don't have your scales, you can do nothing, because it's absolutely foundation. And what, what do we first learn? We first learn what things are called. We learn to name things. This is what Adam does. And through naming, we hear, so to speak, the nature of what we know. I remember the first reading from Sunday. I thought Hannah was drunk. And then she names her child Samuel, because she said a prayer, and God heard her. Samuel. Right? Well, you hear in that root, that Hebrew root, it's God hears, but it's also the root of the word name. So Shem, Hashem, the name, the name of God. Shema Yisrael, hear. O Israel, the Lord thy God. So there's, there's a relationship in Hebrew, Hebrew between, between hearing and the name. The Greek word for name, onoma, is related to the Greek word for law, nomos. So this is where the Latin word for name, nomen, and our word noun, come from. To know the true name of something is to have some insight into its inner law, into its nature. By naming the animals, Adam rules them, 
but not for himself and his own purposes, but in order to shepherd the world according to the inner reality of things, which expresses the wisdom of God. To know anything is to know God in a new way, as ultimately the origin and creator of that reality. So thus, through this, we have contact with the origin of things, their being and purpose. Like when we're given a gift, the first thing we must do is see what it is, appreciate it for what it is, understand its purpose, and understand and even respect the intent and plan of the giver of the gift. And that is why Calvacot relates the liberal art of grammar to the Father, who within the Trinity is origin. He does not proceed, but the other persons proceed from him. And also to mythos, which is a received story that tells us the deep truth of who we are. It is not something that we are to rip apart, necessarily overanalyze, but to ponder in wonder. It is through the gift of tradition that we are first formed as members of a particular community. And in these traditions, we are connected to our origins. Now, I, have, I had a tremendous grace over the Christmas season, that Valerie and I both did, of having all of our children at home at the roost for the first time in a few years. And it just so happened that uh, Fiona, who's a focus missionary at the Air Force Academy and who studied theology and music at Benedictine, um, was asked by a friend of hers to direct the choir for a midnight mass. And she got to pick the music for the, the prelude and, and all the things. And then she realized, gosh, there's not a lot of people in the choir that are actually around. So, you know, we talk about preaching to the choir, so you have to preach just to go to the choir. And, and, and so, as it turned out, we had enough people to have a couple on, on, on each of the voices. Um, but she got to direct a choir of her five brothers and her dad and her sister-in-law and then some others. And um, she wanted, she asked me if, if in one of the preludes we could do this Gaelic carol, and I played the Irish movie, which is called, called Donica Udemecha, I Sing of the Night in Bethlehem. And uh, it came out pretty well. But just the fact that she wanted to do it, like I appreciated the fact that she wanted, she, that she valued that, that somehow I, something got valued, something got passed on. And uh, she had taken a little bit of it, and uh, in my family there's this big group chat with cousins and whatever, there's like 50 people on it. And uh, I sent it out there, and uh, one of the last people that's in my dad's generation, my parents have passed away, but my, my uncle Billy's uh, wife, my aunt Ellen, she, had to, she sent this line on Christmas morning after she heard it that really brought a tear to my eye. She said, I can hear our ancestors, right? So something about that, and this is, you know, just kidding, nobody, nobody in my family speaks Gaelic. We had to, we had to listen to the, to the hymn just to, to try to get the correct pronunciation of the words. I can't parse the words for you. I know what it means because I trust the translator. But somehow understanding grammar in this way as, as receiving a gift and appreciation, appreciating its nature makes any subject connected to the Father, without having to re-inject religious symbols or vocabulary into the subject matter. Right? Like, knowing how to spell correctly and respecting those rules reflects the Father. You don't have to make the kids only spell biblical words. Right? Because sometimes that can come across as somewhat artificial. Caldecott says, the grammar we must learn is a way of using language to praise, to celebrate, to magnify. The experience of the Eden is the experience of the dawn of language and the making of human consciousness, the remembrance of being, and of seeing into the essences of things through words newly minted. The world of creatures is blazing with glory against the background of absolute darkness. And if the world no longer blazes for us, perhaps it is our own. Chesterton says, we are in Eden still, only our eyes have changed. I think this was at end of middle school or, or maybe in high school. My son, Eamon, couldn't be here tonight, but he's losing Kansas City now. He received a writing prompt about what is your favorite word 
or what is your favorite sound? And he wrote this little essay, and his answer was his name being said in an excited way. And the fir first time I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, you narcissist, what have, what have I done? <laughs>
The latter is what we commonly call culture and enlightenment today. But man is always influenced by thought of some kind. His own or somebody else's, that of somebody he trusts or that of somebody he never heard of. Though at first, second, thought at first, second, or third hand, thought from exploded legends or unverified rumors. But always something with a shadow of a system of values and a reason for relevance. A man does test everything by something. The question here is whether he has ever tested the test. So it's through dialect, logic, logos, that the sun's role, so to speak, within the Trinity is manifest. The sun orders. Our minds are ordered toward truth, our wills, toward goodness. And just as it, is, as it is helpful and imperative in our moral formation that we see in all of our choices we pursue one final and overarching good, any true education will help the student see that in all of our knowledge we pursue a different aspects of truth with a capital T. Now think about it. In the, in the order of intellect, the higher the intellect, the more things it will understand with fewer concepts. Right? So you, you know people, you've met people that are really, really gifted in a particular thing. I can see people here, right? And so you tell them two things like, okay, I know you already. Right? I, I studied with, uh, I was in seminary for a bit, and I studied with this guy that we called him Brother Buster. The reason is because he was a religious brother and his last name was Mostasa. I mean, literally, the name was Mostasa. Right? <laughs> so, but he's the most mechanically inclined person I've ever, I've ever met. He like, had like a socket set and a set of screwdrivers like sewn into the lining of his castle because people were asking him to fix stuff all the time. The seminary in Rome at the time was having this fountain put in. And they had the uh, landscape engineers and the people there with the fountain. And, and, and so they had the plans out. And the rector called him over. He's just walking by, like saying the rosary or something. Hey, Brother Moscow, what do you think he was? Like, yeah, it's not going <laughs> And they were like, wait a minute, what do you mean? You know, the architect was, and he goes, yeah, look at these pressure differentials, pump A, pump B, whatever. And he was right. Okay? So think about it. What is the highest possible intellect? The highest possible intellect understands everything that is to be understood, anything that can possibly be understood in one concept. That within the Trinity is the Son, is the perfect self-expression, the perfect understanding of God. The, the, an understanding of God so perfect that it is consubstantial with the confusion and error of modern ed education stemmed from a philosophy which made each individual man, not the lowest, to be the ordering principle of the universe. So, not to get deep in, into the problem of universals in the 13th century, but um, when we talk about horses, we talk about horses because there's something in each individual horse that makes us call it a horse. Now we can call it a horse or, or, or a caballo or something else. It doesn't really matter the word, but the concept's the same. Right? Mm -hmm. William of Ockham and his ilk said, no, there's nothing but the fact that we call them by this thing. The only thing that they have in common is the name. And it's somewhat arbitrary. Right? That has led to a great fragmentation of knowledge, right? And it, it has really led to making the history of philosophy very, very difficult for people because it's multiplied a lot of errors, and so people have to read a lot of bad stuff. And they have to learn a lot of isms, right? Your history of philosophy, or history, the church history, learning a lot of isms. So what is an ism? An ism is an individual point of view that is escalated to a universal point of view. You know, women are awesome. Maybe they're the key to understanding everything. Feminism. Right? Hey, you know, mathematics is great. I can figure some stuff out. Maybe I can figure out everything. Mathematicism. 
scientism, etc. Catholicism. It already means universal. <laughs> um, John Paul II in Fides et Ratio spoke about this in chapter 7. Strabo Caldecott says this. The Pope looks at the contemporary crisis in philosophy and issues a challenge to philosophers to resist tendencies to Aristotelisms, eclecticism, historicism, modernism, scientism, pragmatism, and nihilism. The details need not concern us too much here. Eclecticism simply means a lack of, a lack of concern for coherent thought. Pragmatism means replacing the criterion of truth with decisions based on utility. The beginning of this whole tendency is the loss of a sense of being and meaning, and its end is the nihilistic denial of the possibility of any knowledge at all. Thus, the will to power, exercised above all through the development of machines, gradually takes the place of the will to truth and goodness. This is a situation of philosophy today, and the root of the crisis in our philosophy of education. The loss of the logos that are trivia must find a way to recover. Now, our own thinking, since we are persons and not isolated individuals, we are essentially related to others is dialogical. The best way to encourage it is dialogue, debate, conversation. Speaking in front of you tonight has helped me clarify my own thoughts, and hopefully my words will spark your further conversation that will bring you deeper into the truth. Dialectics, the dialectical method, Socratic dialogue, stems from a conversation designed to expose error. Socrates' examination of of his interlocutors. But its purpose is to draw closer to and find the truth. Learning is meant to happen within a community, face to face. It is lessened by mask to mask, and lessened much more by online or virtual presence. Right? But think about it. If you think education is no more than just transfer of information, copy paste, you might as well just have everybody have a document on right? And just dump information from the notebook of the teacher to the notebook of the, of the student, if there's no interpersonal component at all. But the gift that we ponder in grammar must be assimilated, received, made part of us through dialectic. It is where we take responsibility for our own thoughts. They become our own. Part of us. Don't you feel better when the gift you gave becomes part of the decor at a friend's house? Rather than getting re-gifted or only hauled out when you visit? How would you know? <laughs> so does God. And by the way, so does reality. It's when you see a virtuoso pianist and for a magic moment you wonder whether she's taking the music out of the piano or putting it in. For at that moment, Chopin is revealed to you with a clarity you have never heard before. We are witnessing a gift fully received. We only hear the voice of the Good Shepherd when we follow. And when this following, more than something we do, becomes a part of who we are. Dialect, excuse me, rhetoric, ethos, and the spirit. The example of the pianist underlines a natural transition between the last two arts of the truth. If you are seeing a virtuoso pianist playing with great virtuosity, it's likely that you have not, creeper alert, stowed away into a private studio, but you are in fact at a concert. The pianist is not only proving that she is fully assimilated her gift, she is sharing it. We move from how we know, how we discover truth through dialectic and logic, to how we say or express truth to others, and how it radiates to them through us. When we speak, we share ourselves. We reveal ourselves. In God, Stratford called the reminds us, the knowing, thinking, and the speaking are one with the self-gift that is the nature of the divine. The perfect being is necessarily self-giving, self-communicating. The Logos exists entirely as dialogue, 
dialogues. The word spoken on the breath of God, Ruach, the spirit, the breath of God. God giving himself eternally a perfect act of self-expression, perfectly received and loved. Now this doesn't, doesn't mean that he creates out of necessity, that God has to create. If God created out of necessity, all of creation would share in the necessity of God, and therefore we would be in a pantheistic system. Okay? God doesn't need us. I, I can always tell somewhere around um, early to mid-October, I'll walk through Feral Academic Center and hear the whimpering of young women. And I'm like, they just came out of intro, so intro of theology with Dr. Shinkavich. He told them God doesn't need them. But that was every year. You can do nothing. I would be perfectly happy if you didn't exist. <laughs> but I'm like, well, he chose to create you. He's still happy you're here. But he's God. He can't be any happier than he already is. Because if you could make God happy, you'd be God. <laughs> so, God's image, though, is the perfect example of all communication. In creatures, though, knowing and saying can be distinguished, even separated. Our speech flows from us. But in order to speak truth, we cannot draw only on what is within us. We have to put things in us that are true in order to express them. Such is the metaphysical limitation of creatureliness. In order to be who we are, we have to pass through what we are not. God's got everything inside. We don't have to do that. Thought, says Strat, is an attempt to know, that is, the marriage of self with reality, while speech is an attempt to bring about a meeting of selves, a communion in that marriage. Human speech and thought need to correspond with the order of the cosmos, the order of love. But the truth I communicate will only be effective if it is a truth I have assimilated. Right? The criterion of grammar is correctness. Are you speaking correctly? Did you follow the rules? The criterion of logic is true. Is it true? Is it argument true? The criterion of rhetoric is effectiveness. You try to persuade these people, did they? Was it effective? You could use not great grammar and still get your message across, and people can still follow you. That's okay. Right? There's grammatical errors in the New Testament that people get worried about. Like, Whoa, well, inerrancy is scripture. I'm like, Mark spoke Greek like a Swedish fisherman speaks English. Was <laughs> <laughs> his first language comes in slack? It's still 100% true. Luigi Shusani was fond of saying that you can only communicate a truth that has changed you. I'm presently studying changing the method of teaching Latin in my classes. I'm a little worried about it because it's been a long time. It's an old dog, and we're trying to teach a new trick. But I have to take a class, take an online class right now. Not on that method, not about that method, but in that method, right? Because I can only pass on. What I have received and assimilated. So this focus on who we are to become makes ethos, character formation, morality, fall within the rhetorical art widely understood. It is not just memorizing rules, but freely forming and internalizing habits until they become part of us, until people who experience us experience these values as radiating so to speak. I'm not just passing on these concepts to you tonight. I'm sharing with you something that I've come to know and love. And by sharing them, I've come to know them more deeply. So, out of Immanuel Kant's famous questions, you know, what is man, what can I know, what should I do? That last question, what should I do, is now transformed and deepened to a much more fundamental question. Who am I called to be? And God is calling me through everything I come to know and everyone I come to love. I have only two choices, Calvin says. I can either be or fail to be what God has created and called me to be. So that's the best way to communicate and teach morality. It's not just lists of rules, but by example. The mythos of the lives of the saints and the lived witness of teachers who live their love for God through love of Learning, truth, and goodness, and love for their students. Seeing a virtuoso.
virtuoso at anything makes you want to know that field of endeavor better and makes you respect it for its beauty has been shown to you. This view also leads to an education in true freedom, not in the freedom of indifference where we each make up our own truth, our own rules, but the true freedom where we free ourselves from being what we shouldn't by conforming our lives to God's truth for us. So why, do we, why do we call the pianist a virtuoso? Because they decided, this is how I, sorry, Mr. Suzuki, this is the way I play the piano, right? These are my scales, right? Or did they so conform the habits of, the, of, of their body and their sense of time and movement of their fingers to the objective rules of the instrument and the art that it becomes completely second nature for them. That's what virtue is. That's why we call them a virtuous piano player, a virtuoso. Right? I, have, I have written in many, many, many yearbooks. I got to meet a couple of, a couple of kids that I wrote uh, recently, uh, seeing some kids that I had taught in high school who are now you know, teaching themselves. The real you is saint you. The real you is saint you. On this basis, says Caldecott, we can at least understand the essence of rhetoric, which is not a set of techniques to impress oratory, eloquence, nor a means of manipulating the will and the emotions of others. Sophistry, agonizing but rather a way of liberating the freedom of others by showing them the truth in a form they can understand. As we read from Hugo St. Victor, rhetoric is the discipline of persuading to every suitable thing. Nobody can be persuaded of what they don't understand. To persuade what we are saying must shine through us in such a way that others can grasp it and feel its inherent attractiveness. Thus, St. Albert the Great's definition of beauty, splendor forming, the splendor of the form, finds echo in John Paul II's encyclical on morality, the splendor of the truth. A reality's form, its essence, its deep truth, is seen so clearly, one of the Latin words for beauty is claritas, clarity, that its truth is manifest. I heard this country song. She, she came in, she came into the bar looking like a woman should. What does that mean? <laughs> it means she was beautiful. That's what he's trying to say. Right? Oh, she was good looking. You know what? Looking at her is good. She was being, she was good at being looked at. Right? Because, because the beauty of the form was made manifest. And, you know, not to, to get out of the bar here. What about, what about the beauty of a perfect pass? What about, the, what about that pass in the fourth quarter from Spetson to, to the guy's name is Adam got on high. That was the name of the receiver uh, who caught it. I said if the guy had a basket on his arm, the, the, the ball would have landed in the basket. It was, just, it was just a perfect, absolutely perfect pass. It's beautiful. It was, it was exactly as it should be. Uh, Fulton Sheen talks about Our Lady as the only creature the, the human nature of Christ where the blueprint and the building were the exact same thing. Right? Like, like, it, like it, it turned out perfect. There were no rewrites. There was no settling. There was no thing fell down and be redesigned. Right? It was beautiful. So it is where Calvin again speaks of poetry and dance and the arts, especially drama within the curriculum. For communication in the fullest sense must involve the whole person that is body, soul, and spirit with imagination and intellect in harmony. So the culmination, the consummation of the liberal arts is man fully alive. Man's fully living out the truth and goodness of his nature. It is seen most fully in service to others and especially in the communal act whereby he worships his first beginning and ultimate end. The liturgy is not an add-on in Catholic education. It plays the same role in education 
and it plays in life. It is source and summit. This is from the educational plan of St. Jerome Classic School, which everybody who the classical education should read. Religion is not just one subject within the group, but the key to its unity and integration. The cosmos is an ordered, unified whole because it is created in Christ, in whom all things hold together. Belief in God is our Father, and the world is His beautiful and rational creature. Finds faith and reason, nature and culture, art and science, morality and reality into a coherent and integrated unity. This unified view reaches its summit in worship, which is the highest form of knowledge, and thus the end and goal of true education. So the arts of the Trivium are not only three coincidentally with the three persons of the Trivium. These arts of the trivia which have to do with words, by which we come to name things, know things, and communicate them, more fundamentally have to do with the Word, with a capital W, who is the source and summit of every truth we learn. In our struggle to learn and educate, we become more free, more liberal, and more human, and thus better live out the truth of our calling, our naming, our baptism. We do this, as men like G.K. Chesterton and Strider called the God have shown us, through mythos, logos, and ethos, within a tradition that embraces Western civilization from the Greeks to the fathers to the scholastics to the great educators of today, down to those whose intrepidity and vision is bold enough to start schools like the Chesterton Academy of St. And we do this not only by properly imitating, imaging, if you will, the persons of our hearts and minds, but also by, in all that we do, giving glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without it. Amen. Thank But also, I think you have to bring them in to show them what a classroom 
they, they should be able to realize, they're smart people, to realize the, the qualitative difference that, that there is. I'm sorry. Yeah. Earlier in your talk, you made a passing reference to memory and how people tend to be more different from memory, certainly in educational curriculum today. Mm -hmm. I remember Augustine in the nature of the <clears throat> said that the way in which we image God, we mirror God, is through our understanding of the will of the universe. So in classical education, memory is considered very, very significant, but it's become more impoverished today. Now, my question is, at what point do you think this is just a lack of education or is it even a moral flaw? Because, because I have a friend and colleague who teaches biology. One day he came by my class and he heard me call all those students by name. And he was struck by that because he says he never remembers his students' names. Very odd. What do they feel about that? I think the guy was disingenuous because he had a very large family and most of his kids had matriculated through the college. So any given semester, a number of his students are his own children. I presume he doesn't remember their names. So well, the Romans were famous for just naming their kids ordinal numbers. <laughs> so, you know, if your name's Quintus, Sextus, Septimus, <laughs> you know, at least, at least you know the order of birth, you'd be able to know that. The Greeks were much more, you know, <laughs> yeah, more creative with more names. I mean, obviously it's, it's a lack of understanding of, of what the role of memory is, right? And because it, it also kind of stems from this idea that education is supposed to be easy, right? And maybe it also is a rejection to something in their own formation where they were forced to memorize things that they didn't understand, or there, there wasn't a, a sufficient um, kind of attraction to memorize that. Because, I mean, so, you know, Thomas Aquinas knew the Bible by heart. Oh my gosh, that's so difficult. You know all of that stuff. I'm like, believe me, you know an equivalent number of characters of stuff. Most of it's just garbage. It's just stuff that has been, has been repeated over and over and over again to you. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm getting to the point in my life where, I mean, my brain cells are pretty limited. They're not replenished, right? So I got, I'm got i playing with a, with a team that is not, is not a deep bench here. And I don't like, I don't like Madonna lyrics that come together. Lyrics from Madonna songs, what are they doing? Keeping up space. Taking up space that I need. So, I, I, I think also um, healthy competition is, is, is missing. So, my son is at a, a classical school down in uh, Fort Scott, and they had a kid called uh, St. Martin's Academy, which is just in its fourth year. And they had a, uh, a dinner for the, for the Feast of Our Lady of Rosary, which was really for the Battle of the Pop. <laughs> they did say the Rosary, but they also had a naval battle with, with cardboard boxes and you know, uh, duct tape swords smacking each other around. But at the dinner, at this big banquet, a sophomore recited the entire poem, Lepanto by Chesterton, right? And when he finished it, his companions hit him with spitballs and said, you nerd. No, they didn't. They picked him up like the kid just won the, the, the he just won the state championship, right? I mean, it was, it, they were so proud of him, and it was seen as such an achievement, right? That changes the, the ethos, right, of, of a school. And, and, and I think that, that other, other things that you, that you memorize, we talk about tradition, folk songs, right? Teach people. Folk songs, it's, it's how we, a school should have its own traditions, it should have its own school song. I wrote a school song for Pinehurst Academy, and, and, and uh, a friend wrote, who was still teaching there, said, can you tell us the, you know, how that was written and whatever, because I want to tell the story of my students. And I was like, don't you sing it anymore? Right? These, these are things that you can't, you have to keep alive. And yes, I didn't get deep into the memory part, but when he talks about uh, memory is where is where he sees the fall, right? I mean, who's who's going to have those memories? We, we were talking about my wife and I about things we wish we'd asked our parents, right? Those those memories. If we don't if we don't go and find and ask those questions, they may they may be lost forever. So thank you very much. Thank you. So, St. Jerome's 
Academy is, is, is a classical school in Hyattsville, Maryland. And they, they wrote kind of an educational plan that has the principles and it has the curriculum and whatever. And it, I have never seen, talk about things that are well thought out, something that's that well thought out. And it was for K-8, I believe, at the, at the, at the beginning. So they're, they're trying, they're, they're, they're starting high school now. They're, they're, they're adding it, but um, it really is, it really is excellent. You can use the website, you can find it there. You can find it there, and if you buy beauty, and I'm getting, I'm getting no, no kickback at all. Don't let them drive your children's education. 